What was I thinking is a thing that we often say. That's the title of my message today. This is the thing that we often say whenever we made wrong decisions and somebody advised, advised us and we still thought it was okay, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's going to be a good deal and they talk to you about investing into something and you put your money in there and after a few years, you were in deep yogurt. <laughs> and you, you realize that the great dream didn't happen and you said to yourself, what was I thinking? I think many people have said that at a point in their life. Sometimes when young people are dating, you know, they find a girl of their dreams, so they think. And they find a boy of their dream if a girl is dating a boy. And they, and they feel that he's the perfect match and he's definitely the one. And, you know, I prayed about it and I feel so right in my heart. But then your friend or your pastor or somebody advise you and say, you know, take your time. There's a story behind this person. Unfortunately, I heard it, found out about their parents. And uh, so take your time, take your time. But you went for it. And after a few years, he said to you, you know, you're the only one for me. I love you. I love you. Oh, I'll give my whole heart. I'll climb every mountain. Swim every river, something like that. Cross every ocean, just for you. But he said that to five different girls, and then you found out too late. So, what was I thinking is one of the things that people often say when they have made the wrong choice. So, in order for us to go into the future that we want, the future that we want, we have to own our decisions. Sometimes people do us wrong. I, I give you that. Sometimes we make our own mistakes. But whatever it is, it was your decision. You have to own your decision. From the time of Adam and Eve, Adam said, not my fault. I was happy. All the monkeys were swinging with me. I was swimming with the crocodile. Then you, God, gave me this woman. And then she said, but God, I, you know, you put a talking snake in the garden. It's not my fault. You made a talking snake. So since then, we like to pass the blame to somebody else. I'm not happy today because they did this to me. So as long as we will stop, press the pause button before you make the next decision. Are you listening? There's a pause button in all our lives. You must press that button, especially if it is major decisions, choosing of life partner, relationship, leaving your family, so that you can go and get a better pay in Dubai. So five years you won't be seeing your wife. Off and on you'll come and see your wife or your children. Is it worth it? Can all your money in the world buy back the five years you could have built a life stronger with your husband or your wife or your children? You think five years worth of money can buy back that five years that is gone. So press the pause button and think. Everybody say think. I know for some of you, when you said that, it was a bit painful because you got a headache when you think. You could never use your brain for a long time. So God today wants us to be able to think our way through our life. Many years ago, 2,000 years ago, Rome was the main dominant force on planet earth. The Romans were the most powerful, wealthiest, best looking. I mean, till today you go to Italy, it's known for love. I mean, the Romans were very, very uh, impressive in their lifestyle. And they created a culture on all the nations of the world because they conquered all the nations of the world, all of Europe, all of Asia. And so the Roman culture was the dominant culture 2,000 years ago. In that culture, Jesus came. He came during the most powerful culture in the world. And he brought the culture of the kingdom, which was in total opposite against the Roman culture. It challenged because the Roman culture taught you that if you want to be great, you've got to fight yourself, kill someone, be powerful, earn a lot of money. And you know, in a way, that culture is still uh, lingering in our world today. So you find that in the book of Romans, especially chapter 1, Paul writes to the Roman because their lifestyle was so Roman and they were doing things that it's beginning to be acceptable even today. 
And so what happens is men started marrying men and women started marrying women. And Paul writes, he says, guys, this is unnatural. This is not the way God has planned it. I know today the LGBT movement, even though they are a minority, they are a powerful force. In many churches in Australia, you cannot even hint about same sexes and it is wrong. But it is there in the Bible. It's there in the Bible, in the Old Testament and New Testament. And I know it's coming here because I heard it on Light FM where they're talking about minorities, about the Orang Asli and different races, and then they mention the LGBT. LGBT is not a race, it's a sexual preference. You understand? But it was on Light. So the world is becoming like that. Now, we are not anti-gays and lesbians. We are not. But... The action is in the Bible. It's mentioned in the Bible. So in Romans chapter 1, when Paul writes about many people turning the natural desires into unnatural desires, he mentions all of that. He says that's why God gave them up. So we don't condemn. We welcome. We've got people, we don't know what sexual preference they have in our church. Uh, we don't know whether they're heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual. We don't know. And we are not here to in interrogate you or to judge you. But we are here to say, and listen carefully, in Romans chapter 1, when he mentioned all those kind of things that people were doing, he also mentioned grumbling people, liars. He put in that same category. So while many of us guys, like me, I know I'm definitely not LGBT. Uh, I'm definitely straight. Um, <clears throat> but So I don't have a problem with that. But, you know, so when I see people having a problem with that, I kind of think, man, this is weird. But then I have a problem with gossiping and backbiting. So those things we think are smaller sins. Now, there are consequences of sin, you understand. Whatever you sow, you will reap. So in some of these sins, when they sow, they reap big time. So there's, there's diseases and all of that, you understand. So you, you don't get a disease because you are backbiting, but when you practice some. Do you understand what I'm saying? But we don't judge people. Sin is sin. So when he's writing to the Roman culture, he's writing to the Roman Christians, and he wrote in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, these words. He said, I beg you, I appeal to you, my brothers. And he says, I appeal to you, therefore, because therefore means a continuation from somewhere. So in chapter 11 of Romans, he talks about the unsearchable riches of God, that God is a gracious God, that he loves you and he doesn't want to destroy you because he is a God of grace and you respond to that grace by faith. Amen. Amen. Therefore, because God is so good and his plans are fantastic for you, therefore, I beg you, he says. He says, I want you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. God doesn't want a dead sacrifice. I, one day I went to a church recently in PJ, and all they were, the first time I went for a meeting, it's a pastor's meeting, and all they were talking about is how we must all prepare to die, to die, to die, to die. I was looking at them and thinking, you have a hard time living, you're talking about dying. You know, God wants us not to die. Very easy to die. All you have to do is go to a country like Pakistan, stand up there and just say some bad words about their religion. They'll light you on fire. You'll be a man on fire immediately. You, your family and everything, your dog, cat. One shot, they'll throw you through, not pastor. Yeah, your pastor is here, he'll tell you. So God doesn't want you to die because Jesus already died for you. Hello. He wants you to live for him. So it's tough living. How many of you married people can say amen? Okay, I'm just checking. Because it's tough getting up in the morning, tough making decisions, tough forgiving, tough keeping appointments, tough saying yes, and tough saying no. So he writes to us, and he writes to us today, 2,000 years later, offer your body as a living sacrifice. Listen, when you've used up your life and you're no good and half one leg is inside the grave already, the other can't even move, oh God, use me. You're no use. Don't waste God's time. All right? That time, no point praying, oh God, when you're sick, if you heal me, if you get up, of, help me get out of hospital, or you help me cancel my debt, I promise you, Lord, I will serve you. I will go to the orang asli, the orang utan, I will go to the all kind of, I will give my life. Too late. Too late. So while your faculties are working, he said, offer to God a living sacrifice, not just one hour on Sunday, 
Sunday you come here and sit down, you're absolutely doing nothing. I'm doing and the others are doing all the things. <laughs> True or not? Not just on Christmas and Easter. Not once in a while when you think something about God. Not when you get the hospital bill from your doctor and he gives you three months to live. Offer every day, Lord, here am I. I may not be perfect, none of us are, but here am I. This is the best thing you've got. So come on, baby, use me. And he will, because he loves you. And you are a unique person. And you're the only one of your kind. After you, there's no more. So offer to God today, your body, every day, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship or your reasonable service. Then he says, listen, this is very important. In view of the fact that Jesus has done everything for you to save you, to take you to heaven, he says, so do not conform to this world, but be transformed, where? By the renewing of your mind. What was I thinking? That's the area you need to renew. You were born again in your spirit, but God cannot give your mind a new mind. You have, he is saying, renew your mind. Don't try, don't ask God to renew your mind. You have to. Don't be conformed. That word conform means to be pressed because he was writing to the Romans. They were behaving in sexually or, or materially, their mindset. They just, you know, to, to be conformed, you don't have to have any energy. All you have to do is get up every morning and behave like the world. They lie, you lie. They cheat, they tell lies. They do all kinds of stuff. You do the same. No energy to be disciplined, to be uh, 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 withdrawn from things like that. To be conformed is easy. So he writes to the church, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. Everybody say transformed. So what is your mind supposed to be? Conformed or transformed? Transformed. And you have to make that choice. He said by renewing your mind. Now, to renew something, let's say your car seat in your car is torn and, and broken and you take it to the accessory shop and you say to the guy, just put a cloth over it. That's not renewing. That's covering up. Because the old things will still break through even the new cloth is there. It's got to be ripped apart, torn up. How many of you understand what I'm saying? So we've got to be like more serious about our mindset. That's where the battle is. God has got no problem answering you, healing you, blessing you, doing all those things. But our mindset, and there are many Christians who just have a mindset that is opposite, contrary to the word of God. So they know God's word says this, but they're doing completely opposite. Because they've been conformed too long. Like us, under the old regime, you know, old kind of, administration in Malaysia that has just been renewed. We, we, you know, we got a new government. Because we are so used to giving bribes, we are so used to lying, we are so used to uh, doing all those things that for 60 years we were conformed to be like that. Now, to be renewed, hey, I don't have to give a bribe to this cop. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I pay the price. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah? And so you, 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 you find that Life is different. I'm so used to that lifestyle. I, I have to cheat a little bit to get by. But now, no. Cheating, you're going to be exposed if you cheat, you know, if you get caught. So the whole conformity thing is such a challenge that God wants you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And watch this. That you may prove. Listen. You may prove. You prove that what God said is true. He said that you may prove what is the will of God. You prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Look up here for a little while. God's will is always good, always acceptable, and always perfect. Perfect. Complete. When you say, I want to know the will of God, it's not something mystical. You, you know, some Christians are so weird, right? They go to a dress shop or a shirt shop. Oh, I don't know what the will of God is. Should I buy a red shirt or a blue shirt? Oh, Lord, please show me your will. If the red shirt moves, I'll buy. If the blue shirt moves, I'll buy. You know, they make Christianity weird. I want to know the will of God. Oh, I'm praying to know the will. What is God's will? Is it God's will for me to stay in this church or to leave and to go to another country? Is it God's will? They make God's will a mockery. All right? 
Some people say, if God speaks to me, you know, God always speaks to you in your heart softly, but He has given you His Word. That means He'll never change His Word, which is called the Bible. Are you with me? The will of God and the Word of God never contradict. So you cannot say, God told me this, but it's not in the Bible and it's contradictory to the Bible. The Spirit of God spoke to me. So a lot of people, they will say, if only God spoke to me. You know, if God speaks to you really, literally, you will die. Only a few people in the Bible who saw God, even that they just saw a glimpse of God like Moses and look at what great things he had gone out and done. I hear people saying, you know, God spoke to me last night. Look at your face. (laughs) If you see God, your face will shine. They had to put a cloth around Moses' face because it was brighter than the sun. Are you with me? Paul saw Jesus and his life changed. He went out and started the New Testament church. Mary saw Jesus, became the mother of our Savior, saw God. She saw an angel. So whenever people say, you know, God spoke to me last night and he said, sweetheart, that was not God. That was your old boyfriend. (laughs) Somebody, some hantu. Not. Because God speaks to you very clearly and always in his word. Are you with me? So when people, when you tell them, you know, come and serve, come and be joined to what we so many areas to serve. I want to pray for the will of God. Well, the will of God is always good, it's always acceptable, and it's always perfect, but you have to prove it. Let me give you an example. You see a person who's got a good marriage, all right? They listen to the word of God. They apply the word of God, not only on good days, but on bad days. They choose to forgive. They choose to go the extra mile. You try being married. How many of you have been married for 40 years? Can I see your hand? Hanan, I'll slap you from here (laughs) for 40 years. This year, I will be 40 years marriage. You think it was easy. (laughs) 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 All right? 40 years. Divorce, we never say. Kill each other, yes. 40 years. Forgive. I have said, I'm sorry. I don't know how many times. It's always my fault. (laughs) And you'll never meet a more perfect husband than me, honestly. (laughs) Very good in everything. (laughs) Now, if you see marriages that are working and we are still very much in love and very much enjoying each other's company, that was proven that marriage can work and it can be good. It doesn't have to be ugly. It doesn't have to end negatively. It doesn't have to hurt the children. We all don't like that man. When he becomes old, he's all alone. His children hate him. He's sick. His grandchildren hate him. Nobody likes him. Even his friends are disgusted with him. You don't want to... How many of you want to end up like that? None of us do. You see, God's will is always good. It's always acceptable. God's will is always perfect. But you have to prove it. You look at a person who is doing financially well. Some Christians are doing really well, some Christians are not. Well, the Christians who are doing well, not because they are more handsome or God favors them more, they prove that giving works. They regularly, good times, bad times, some of us have been cheating God for a long time, but we don't go and check your account, but you've been cheating God for a long time. Why God didn't bless me? You've not been giving the way God told you to give. You rob God in your tithes. You don't consistently give God. And you've heard the word of God. You read the word of God. But sometimes when they come up to share the offering, you purposely suddenly look at the ceiling, you know, like something is up there. (laughs) Or suddenly you look at your phone because you're convicted. How are you going to prove what is good and what is the acceptable and perfect will of God? Okay, so he says, you must renew your mind. There must come a time in my life and in your life where we're going to say, if I'm still thinking what I was thinking and how I was thinking last time, I will always end up in the same place where I am now. In the future, I will end up in the same place if I keep thinking how I was thinking. Everybody okay so far? Nobody angry with me? I think this is your Bible, all right. So, what are the things that we need to do? We need to renew our mind. We need to renew our mind. 
We need to be literally aggressive, intentional. This is the bad way of thinking. But no, this is the, we, this is, we, I am an Indian. Shut up. You are a Christian. Renew your mind. It means like the old car seat, you have to tear it out. It's broken. It's not working. So some of our old concepts, this is how my father would think of my grandfather thinking. But this, you are a brand new person in Christ. Your generation is going to inherit the blessing that God is going to put upon you. Are you receiving this today? The blessing your children are going. Otherwise, you'll be a same useless, mediocre person all the time. Got somebody to blame. So to restore means you have to tear away all those that things that look ugly so that the new you is the born-again person Jesus came to die for and spill his blood for. Renewing takes time, but look at me. Time is your friend. Yeah. You got time. You're not dead, right? Some of you look like that. Should have buried you a long time ago. You got time is your friend. So renewing will take time. Proof what Malachi says. What did he say in Malachi 3.10? Bring all the tithes in earth. People still don't listen to that. Is it the gross income or net income? Till today you are asking that state, that stone age question. No wonder you're not proving that God can rebuke the devourer. Otherwise the devourer will sit in your house and make sambal. And every day during lunchtime you're eating with the devil. He says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. So you don't have to go around shooting the devil, rebuking, fighting, doing... He will rebuke the devil for your sake. The devourer is eating you up. You better wake up. And he says, and prove me now, says the host, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out the blessing. Ask anybody who is living a good life, a fit life. It wasn't accidental. They had to do it again and again and again. So renewing the mind is the same thing, all right? So let me just give you some speed humps, speed bumps to slow you down. Because you've got to slow down and think. Otherwise, you'll end up, what was I thinking? Are you Indian people, they like to knock their head, like, kadavale, kadavale, kadavale. Huh? What was I thinking? What was I thinking? Don't end up your life like that. So here are a few speed bumps for us to think about. Some assumptions that we might have, we think, we think it's okay. Let's renew that thinking. Are you with me? Number one. If I find the right person, everything will be all right. Young people, listen. It's not the right person. Are you the right person? Have you trained yourself to become? Because when you train yourself to become the, young per the right person, people will be attracted to you. You understand? People reject you because you're the wrong person. So are you the right person? What are you thinking? What's your thinking like? All right? Number two, my situation is unique. Not at all. Listen. Everybody's situation is the same. You are a unique person. Amen. Look at me. You are special. You are special. No one like you. You are a unique person. But your situation is the same. If you go and see a doctor, how is it the doctor can come up to certain conclusions about you? If you're suffering a pain or something is not in order in your life, and you go to a doctor, he takes a few tests, he comes up, this is your problem. How does he know? Because every human body is the same. You understand? You don't have two lungs, uh, four lungs. Right? You're not, you're not, you, every human, when he tests a human body, he knows what's going through, what's the pain, more or less, he can come to some kind of conclusion and hopefully bring a cure. Now God deals with all of us the same. Our situation is not special. You don't understand my situation, a pastor. If you were married to my husband, that, no, we're not married and we don't want to marry your husband. Thank you very much. Yeah? But how have you been responding? How have you been behaving to your wife and to your children and your language? So the challenge, the pressure is on us that we need to renew our minds. Okay, so far? Mm, thank you, Sunita. I know this is wrong. Here's the other speed hum. I know this is wrong, but it makes me happy. And God wants me to be happy. Now, I know God wants you to be happy. Of course He does. But if it's wrong, it's never going to make you happy. If that attitude, if that behavior is wrong, you can try to beat and bend yourself around the rules and the regulations. 
you're never going to be happy. You can try to outsmart, argue, give your reasons. You can try to talk yourself that it's okay, what? After all, they do this to me, I also do back to them, fine. But you'll never be happy. And God wants you to be happy. But if you do the wrong thing, you will never be happy. Here's another one. If I only had it, I will be satisfied. So I get in debt to get what I want. That's wrong. You're never going to be happy. If I only had it, I'll be satisfied. How many of you have got a tattoo on your body somewhere? I don't want to see them. Just ask it. I like tattoos. Don't get me wrong. I like tattoos on other people's body. Not on mine. I, I don't have. But you know people who have a tattoo, they, they always, not one they will have, right? They will always have another. They like to have one more because it really looks cool on them. Now, some people, it really looks cool uh, having tattoos. I know my son-in-law has got tattoos all over his chest, his arm. He, he put my daughter's name on his arm. This is Brad. I said, what's wrong with you? But he loves her so much. But what I'm saying is that you will never be satisfied. So it's better not to then have it and spend the rest of your life owing and paying the debt. You're being foolish. You understand? Is this helpful? I hope some of you who are getting jobs and all of that, who oh, I'll buy that, I'll buy that iPhone. I, everybody's got it. I'll buy it. Then you owe all the time. Or if it breaks down, somebody steals it. What was I thinking? What was I thinking? I know you all don't like subjects like that, but here's another one. My secret is safe with me. Let me tell you, no secret is safe, especially if you're going into another relationship. I appreciate secrets husbands and wives have together as husbands and wives, where they sometimes don't tell the children or they, or they you know, just don't tell anybody because they're husband and wife, they're a team. But if you're going into a relationship, don't say, no, I've got some secrets, but it's safe with me. Nothing is safe. One day, it will come out. Jesus said, what is spoken in darkness will be shouted in the rooftop. So have no secrets with your spouse or with your, with, with your God. Bring everything to God. God, I got bad, dirty thoughts sometimes. And he'll say, I understand. I'll forgive you. You were straight away wondering, was pointing at this Brandon dirty thought. <laughs> Slap him one time. See what happens. We all got problems. We need to say honestly to God when you're doing your devotion, say, God, I had very angry thoughts. I was thinking of five ways to poison my husband. <laughs> but because I know previously he has eaten poison before, nothing hurts him. So I had a new thought, oh Lord, I want to choke him tonight. Take care, Sampai Mati. Huh? How many of you wives had thoughts like that? Don't put your hand up. Okay. So how can I renew my mind? We know that it is important. Listen, Christian, you can pray and pray and ask everybody to pray for you. Your family life, your relationship, your future will never, never change. Sorry to tell you. That's why God said through Paul, tell them, you see, Paul was like the new kid God had to use one more time on planet. He had the 12. One person betrayed him, and then they restored somebody else. But the 12 were like stuck to Jewish tradition, Jewish thinking. God said, I think I need to go back one more time. So he came back. Jesus came one more time, knocked Paul off his horse, said, I'm going to start with this guy because this guy is a very sharp guy. He's a Pharisee, and he knows the culture of the world, and he was my number one enemy. I'm going to bring a new fellow into this. And so he raised up Paul to come into all our lives. He raised up Paul so that we can renew our thinking. The biggest enemy and the battle is not the devil. It's something in between these two years. It's called your brain. That is where the fight goes on for choices, decision-making, and the future we want to have. So that we won't have all those unnecessary regrets and embarrassment. So I read this book by, and you can get it, it's all over in the bookstores, one of the best books, not even Christian, but it's a great book. It's called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen R. Covey. And this is what he said about one of the habits to develop. If you can develop this, 
This will help you in your business, it will help you in your future and your planning. Now, first of all, I want everybody to look at me. This is not your Bible, this is from a book. So no point looking at your phone, it's not in your Bible phone as well. Look at me. Firstly, I want you all to relax. Don't fall asleep, relax. I want you to take a deep breath and listen carefully to what I'm about to say. This will help you tremendously. It has helped me. I want you to clear all your thoughts. I don't want you to worry about after the service what you're going to eat for lunch. I want you to clear all your worries about your schedules, bills not paid, assignments you have to do. Just clear your thought and listen carefully. I know for us Indians and Chinese that to talk about death or funeral is very pantang. But the reality is, it happens to everyone. Doesn't matter what race you are, but it happens. So I want you to sit back and relax, and I want you to think with me. You were going to a funeral of a loved one, someone you loved a lot. I want you to picture yourself driving to the funeral parlor. I want you to picture yourself parking your car. Now, as you walk inside the building, you see flowers, soft music playing. You see faces of friends and relatives as you walk by. You feel their shared loss, the sorrow, and also the love and the joy that they have for the person who is deceased. As you walk down from the back to the front, down the aisle, you come to where the casket is. Suddenly, you come face to face with yourself. You came to your own funeral. All these people were here to honor you at your funeral, to express feelings of love and appreciation for your life. As you take your seat and wait for the service to begin, you are handed a program in your hand. There are four groups of speakers who will be speaking at your funeral. The first is from your immediate and extended family, like your wife, your husband, your children, brothers, sisters, mom, dad, whatever. And they've come to speak on your behalf. The second group are a group of people who are your close friends, maybe two or three of them who have been your friend for a long time. The third group of people going to speak, they are from your workplace, from your profession. And the fourth group of people who are going to speak are from your cell group, your church, or your ministry, or your co-worker in the church serving together. I want you to think carefully. What would you like each of these people to say about you? What would you like them to say about your life? What kind of a husband? What kind of a wife? A father or a mother? Or a son? Or a daughter? What would you like the words to reflect about you? What kind of a friend were you at the office? What character would you like them to have seen in you? What contributions have you made? What achievements would you want them to remember? I want you to look carefully at the people all around you in your mind. What difference have you made in their lives? So to renew our minds, it means to have this, as Steve Covey says, as a frame of reference in your mind. You must begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end, sounds confusing? No. Today is a new beginning for every one of us who wants to renew our mind and have a great future. We cannot predict when we are going to go, but at one point we will all go. For some of you never thought about this. Maybe your, your friends used to say, Ah, la, live well, la, die, die, la, who cares? All my friends are in hell anyway. I can't wait to go to hell. I want to have a hell of a party. Are you, are you sure they're having a party? Huh? Oh my, I've heard people say that at funeral. I don't care, I know God, 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 heaven, hell, what the heck, I just enjoy, uh, die, die, uh, yeah, really. But when they're dying, they're holding on to the nurse skirt. Missy, sir, tamo pagi. sudah mari, tamo pagi, missy. That's a horrible, horrible way to end their life. So, always have the end in your mind as a frame of reference. So today, we renew our minds. I'm going to be a better husband. I'm going to be a more thoughtful person. I'm going to sacrifice more. I'm going to give. What is my tithe? I don't stop at my tithe. I go beyond my tithe. I want to invest spiritually into the lives of people. What I'm giving, you think in heaven, 
my Malaysian ringgit or US dollar is going to help at all. You stupid dumbass. You stupid. That's why the Bible, Jesus said that. I didn't say it. Jesus said, the man said, I will build. I will build. I will tear down my barns. And he says, God said to him, you fool, tonight. So to renew our minds, to think, guys, maybe we made a lot of bad choices in the past. And we ended up in places we didn't want to end up. But it's a brand new day. Amen. Hallelujah. It's a brand new day. Thank you, God, for allowing us to get up and to enjoy in the house of God a brand new day. Today, decide, I will offer my body, my ability as a living sacrifice. When people tell me to come join in connect group, join in prayer meeting, don't make some stupid excuse. You'll be embarrassed to answer God one day. When people say, come on, get on board, serve together, don't make some crap excuse. I'm your pastor. Listen, I'm your friend. I'm your trainer. I'm here to challenge you so that when you come to that end, there'll be lots of people. Listen, for 40 years, two years, I've been doing funerals. Some funerals, I'm the only person there. Somebody called me to go, but they didn't come. Nobody wanted to come. And I had to force myself to say nice things about that person. Even the wife didn't want to come. I've been at funerals where the sister or the brother would come in and curse the body that person just did. Curse people who have committed. I've done funerals for people who have committed suicide. Hung themselves. Son came home, found the body. The relatives curse, useless, drunkard, blah, 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 curse and curse. And I have to tell them, shh. He cannot hear you. Then I've done funerals where the place was covered with people. Wrong lines. You couldn't even stand. You couldn't even finish the lines. People were coming up and, and, and sharing their words of great joy and how this person has blessed us and his contribution and his love. I, I remember I didn't do the funeral, but I was there at my mom's funeral because she died in my house. All the relatives came, and her grave was like a garden. It was covered. All the things that mommy loved, all the flowers. I stood in amazement. It was like a garden. I was thinking, that's how my mother had that many friends from all over the place. Now, I don't want you to get negative, but I want you to think carefully because this is very important. I want you to carefully think, in the next seven days after this service, starting today, how are you and your family going to renew your minds? Sit down, maybe just you and a friend. Write down in the next seven days, what are you going to stop thinking and doing? What are you going to start doing if you have not started yet? Or maybe you have already gone on a program that's a good discipline, and the, and the enemy is making you tired and you want to give up your Bible reading and, and, your, and your fasting and prayer and, you know, or, or, or your tithing. You want, ah, what's the point? I've given so long. You ask anybody who's fit and goes to the gym. You think one day he wore his Nike shoes, puts on his shorts, puts on a T-shirt, went there, picked up one, two, three, four, and got fed up after that. He looks like that today. It was day in, day out. Raining. Hot days, he ma made sure he went. You think people got good marriages? Bad times, bad news, closure of business. Doctors bill, they still loved each other, stuck to the game, and built a great sustaining marriage. That can happen to you. That can happen to me. I'm not over. Stella and I are still very young. Considering, I mean, considering, comparing to all of y'all, y'all are very old, uh, but I, I like mixing with y'all, you know. But I, we look forward to many, many more years serving you, serving you, serving other people, being a blessing to other people. I, you know, and I believe we, we got no lucky streak on us. In fact, I'm very, very unlucky. I never won a prize in my life. No lucky draw. I ever got nothing. Even my own church, they won't give me a lucky draw on Carnival Day. My own church. Not even one chocolate. Nothing. <laughs> oh, man. So please take it not as a scolding message, but as a message that tells you, you can make the change. God's not going to send 
a, an angel, a pixie from heaven with gold dust and sprinkle financial blessing. You got to make the sacrifice and make sure that, you know, it's, that it's filled with joy even though it's painful when you give. When your giving hurts you, some people say when it hurts you, stop giving. But I want to tell you, if you want to bring out the best in your life, it'll hurt sometimes. It hurt. When you go to the gym, you think no, no pain. Pain. When you give financially, you think you, there's no sense of, like you lost something. But you gain. So one day, don't worry about seeing your, your relatives and what they're going to say at the end because you'll be dead. But you'll be in God's presence. As I said just now, now we close our eyes, we lift our hands, we worship God by faith. One day we close our eyes and worship God, we open it, He's standing right in front of us. And He will say, well done. Huh? Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, receive that. Do you receive the word today? Yes. Amen? Let's stand together. If you receive the word, I want you to stand and worship the Lord. And put your whole heart into your worship. Don't be distracted by this, that and the other. Don't be distracted by people who are around you, pe people who are in front of you. Don't worry about what people may have said about you last week, yesterday. Today is a brand new day, brand new opportunity. Worship God. Do the right thing. Make the right choices. Okay? None of us are perfect, but God is good. God is gracious and He's given us this time to break through. Let's sing this chorus together and let's worship the Lord.